Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. This is your host, Brother Muhammad Maxwell Hassan. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Muslim Network TV, Canada Today Youth Edition. Yes, my middle name is Maxwell. You won't believe how many times people have been asking me about that. But for today, we got an amazing, amazing topic. It's not talked about enough, but oftentimes the topics that aren't talked about are the ones that we need to talk about the most. Now, today we were so, supposed to have Sister Audrina here today, but unfortunately due to some last minute extenu extenuating circumstances, she's unable to participate. But, you know, as they say, you know, when you have a plan A, you got plan B, you know, things will work itself out. So we do have a very special co-guest here today to fill her in. And so who's that special co-guest, co I should say? It's Amanda Hassan. Now, who's Amanda? You might look at Amanda. There she is right there. <laughs> Amanda is a Humber College graduate from a law clerk, currently studying law, and she just published her first book. It's a novella. It's called Joyless, and she has a real love of reading, and she's a volunteer at Sound Vision and the Faith of Life Network. Thank you, Amanda, for stopping by. With us here today also, we have Prince Khan, and your majesty, your highness. We got Prince in the house. I mean, what cool, what better name than that? Like, I mean, look at that, Prince Khan. Prince is a business consultant at the Halton region, serving small businesses in Oakville, Burlington, Milton, Georgetown, and by providing them sound strategies to be successful. His love for reading was developed later in his life when he realized that by not starting early, that there were core pieces to his personal growth which were missing. It's almost like a puzzle piece, you know? There's some things that just aren't there. Uh, by conditioning his mind to have a reader-focused mentality, Prince has been able to adopt and adapt personal strategies to help him read and apply his learnings to his clients. In this session, in this interview here today, uh, Prince will share his experiences on how he overcame this reading roadblock and strategies youth, Muslim youth, can apply in order to read and comprehend the books that they read. Thank you so much for stopping by, Prince. We're really excited to hear your insights and experiences on this whole topic. So as always, I'd like to, you know, for, for our co-guests and for our viewers here today, I always like to kind of dive a little bit more into their personal stories. You know, it's, this is a way to connect with folks. So we'll start, ladies first, Amanda here. Uh, Amanda, if you can kindly share with us and share with the viewers, uh, if you could recall a time how reading was so important in your life. And, you know, if you, I mean, could you trace back to your earliest memory of reading? I mean, what can you think of a story where reading was super important and helpful uh, in your life? Uh, yes, um, I can recall that. Um, I can remember as far back when I was in middle school, um, I remembered there was a library that had a wide variety of different books. And I was very drawn to the library and I keep reading like a lot of books, uh, particularly fiction books like Goosebumps and other uh, teenage books. That would um, that would describe some issues uh, related to like teenagers, like such as Orca, and uh, and other uh, fiction books that that discusses uh, about a variety of different things. Very cool, man. That's a shout out to Arl Stein, like with the Goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, man, that 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 was one of my earlier series as well. Like that taught me to read, like the. I mean, that, that we can talk about that all day, but let's go to Prince, man. Prince, buddy, how has reading impacted your life? Could you recall a moment? Could you recall any, maybe your earliest memory? Like, could you share a story of how reading was super, super important and in, in, in a key turning point in your life? Absolutely. Uh, first, Amanda, uh, Ariel Stein. Um, I never used to read the books, but I used to watch the shows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was the opposite of that. So personally, when I was younger, um, I remember, you know, elementary school, middle school, most of high school, I actually never liked reading. Um, and I was actually very naive about school, personal development, things like that, that I thought, hey, you know what, in, in the future, you know, I will eventually become successful. And I don't really need to worry about that stuff right now. And all I really wanted to do at the time was play with my friends and be outdoors and not really care about reading. And, you know, in schools, teachers used to say, I need to read more and be more attentive in class. And because I wasn't being involved in all the group discussion, it was kind of embarrassing for me because I'll be honest with you, when I was, for example, in grade six, my brother used to read the books for me <laughs> and oh, yeah. he used to use my paper and he used to actually write the paper for me. Hopefully my grade six teacher isn't listening right now, but uh, those are the circumstances. I'll read maybe a page 
and I just wouldn't get it. And it just was so, so difficult for me because I just didn't have interest in reading the books that they were providing us. So where it really started was in grade 12, college, university, where I realized that I missed out on a core skill in my life that I needed to be successful. Reading comprehends well with writing as well as speech. So one area where I was really, two areas where I was really lacking was writing and speech, which was incumbent from the reading that I didn't really do when I was younger. So my friend at the time, who's now my wife, um, and she used to edit all my papers. And it, embarrassingly enough, she used to go, your grammar is really, really bad. And I couldn't really say anything because obviously I didn't get used to reading when I was younger. And my brother was the same thing. When he used to edit my papers in college, he used to laugh and say, you're in college now. How are you still not being able to write properly? And it, honestly, it just really came down to, you know, not being reading. Uh, and if I'm reading textbooks, not being able to read more than five to 10 pages at a time and then going to sleep for 25 to 30 minutes and then maybe playing games or stuff the rest of the day. So I realized the weakness close to the end of university where I was graduating and now I'm going to my career. And I realized, hey, you know what? To get a good career, you need to be able to interpret good reading, good writing, good language skills, which I was obviously struggling with. So Alhamdulillah, long story short, I made it through university. I finished with distinction with some help with my, you know, my brother, my, my wife. But it was very, very difficult because of the skills that I was you know, supposed to gain when I was younger, but I didn't get until later on in life. And that's why, you know, I find it very, very important to focus on them when you're younger because it's going to impact your future for sure and your, the career that you get. If you want a good career, it's going to have a big impact if you don't actually read early in life. All right. Marshall Prince was well, very, I guess that was a romantic twist. Who would have thought that, you know, your, your uh, special someone ended up becoming, you know, like that was involved. In the, I mean, what a, I mean, this is something that you can't, write down like in the in the what am i even saying like overall it was just a romantic it's great that books kind of connected you to your significant other in one way or another so that's awesome man and again who i, I guess it, it was a more of a later kind of thing uh, that happened in your life and uh, i think for a lot and actually that leads this is a nice segue i'm gonna bounce it back to you prince uh with regards to this whole situation right now i mean i'm sure you're not alone, and not, I mean, there, there's a whole sea of people where, let's say, they just kind of delayed the love of reading or delayed the skill of reading. Like, I mean, serious reading, not like reading like instructions or or posters or what have you. I mean, in your general assessment, I mean, from an observational point of view, what would you say is like the biggest roadblocks, or what would you say is the general trends with regards, particularly because this is a, a show about Muslim youth. What do you think Muslim youth, how do they look at reading in general? If you could give an overall assessment uh, about that, just based on your personal experiences. Absolutely, Brother Muhammad. That's a fantastic question, and I have a good answer for that. Um, what I've noticed, at least in our culture, a lot of our parents really focus on our growth through schools. They don't really focus our growth through education, through you know, external reading, like leadership books, management books. Anything in regards to business, for example, right? They just really want you to focus on school, do well in school. And this can actually have a negative impact to you in the future because what you end up doing is you learn all about these books, but you never had those street smarts to be successful. So books, being book smart is great, but unless you get a, the job done, it, nobody's going to really want to hire you or keep you on. I'll, I'll give you an example. I spoke to uh, a small business owner a couple of weeks back. Uh, he is an optometrist. He has a business in Oakville. And he was telling me that he recently had hired a graduate. And she was super smart, uh, you know, on paper, she had, you know, a huge interest in optometry. She had great grades. She had everything. The moment he hired her, he put her to the front desk as an internship, you know, getting her the exposure. She wouldn't even lift up the phone and call anybody or answer the phone. And when he inquired to her about it, she's like, well, I didn't realize I was supposed to pick up the phone. Well, it's part of your job, right? These skills you don't learn through books and at least certain type of books. You need to have those street smarts as well. So again, being book smarts is great, but having those street smarts really comes through this, these other novels, these extracurricular books through Tony Robbins, let's say, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, financial literacy. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And you have to remember, no matter what you do in life, anything and everything is a business, right? So you have to, the reason why I really promote business books is because either, regardless of if you become an engineer in the future, a doctor in the future, a lawyer, whatever your parents want you to become, at the end of the day, who do they work for? They work for a business, right? So having the knowledge of how businesses run and how they you know, function day to day 
it's so, so important in society. And a lot of students have to understand that you have to go beyond, above and beyond what your school is teaching you and learn these skills through your libraries and local community centers. Understood, Mashallah, great points. Uh, I mean, when it comes to, like there are some things that you can't just pick up with books and maybe there's there seems to be a disconnect with what society values and what they're teaching us in the education system it's not like one-to-one -one and proportional great man i appreciate that uh, amanda what, what was what's your take on this what do you think overall if you were to examine uh, our brothers our sisters the youth people in college university even younger let's say they're in high school even below that let's say elementary in the school, generally speaking, in your estimation, how do Muslim youth look at reading? Uh, how do they, what's their outlook or perspective towards it, in your opinion? In my opinion, I think uh, technology has really changed the way how we read and how much exposure we have with reading. Since uh, majority can be found online, a lot of people just learn to maybe skim but not actually read and actually gain critical thinking through reading. I think that could only be possible if, if that could be done by reading a physical copy of a book because you can highlight, you can underline, you can write notes on the margin. You could actually highlight and write on, like sometimes maybe you could actually type, but I think the difference behind the screen and behind the book is the book, the physical cover of the book actually allows you to think more critically than I think reading online. Because I think reading online makes you like skim faster and it doesn't actually create you to gain critical thinking skills and actually reading uh, from a hard copy book. Marshall, that's a very good point. Like we're, we're throwing technology into the mix. It's, it's a, it, I guess from what I gathered is that it's easier to be distracted. Uh, yeah. So in terms of like skimming through it, I, I mean, I'll just be blunt and honest. Like for me, old is gold. Like I love a, if you ask me, hey, would you rather have a physical copy of a book or would you rather have a PDF? For me personally, if it was a book to enjoy, I'd, I'd take the hardcover uh, any day of the week only because it's like a it's an experience. It's different. I mean, can you imagine? You, I'm sure you've you've experienced this yourself in prints. I'm sure you have as well where let's say you're skimming through, let's say you have a PDF copy of a book, you're, you're scrolling through it and then, oh, you got a Facebook notification or oh, you got, you got some, look at that, so he's, he's noticing. So then all of a sudden you're, you're not immersed in that and all of a sudden you, you have to attend to something else and then before you know it, you just broke connection and before you know it, you don't even open up that uh, PDF again. Um, so good point, Amanda. So it looks like technology really is a big obstacle um, Prince, can I ask you, what would you say are some obstacles that a lot of Muslim youth are facing when it comes to reading? I mean, uh, is it, I'll, I'll give you one example that I found and perhaps you can build on it or, or, you know, take it a different direction. You know, sometimes a lot of people, when they say reading a book, they might equate it to being nerdy, quote unquote, right? Who wants to be, you know, when you're growing up, oh, you want to read a book? That must be, that's a very uncool thing. Um, does that have anything to do with it? Peer pressure, does that have uh, any repercussions? I mean, if not, then what other ways that you would, what other, I mean, what other um, avenues or other kind of roadblocks that you feel are problems that Muslim youth face when it comes to reading in general? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question, Mohammed. Um, in my opinion, Muslim youth, um, and I've mentioned this in my last point, but our parents are so focused on, you know, the education system. They don't focus on the life skills system and development through learning from various books that actually teach you about life and financial literacy, or they teach you about how to you know, brand yourself in a certain way. Uh, so there's lots of young individuals that are opposed to reading actually, because they find it either very difficult, they don't wanna be nerdy, uh, there's maybe peer pressure, as you mentioned. There's lots of reasons why Muslim youth do not wanna read. And the only time they do actually sometimes read is because they're forced by their parents to actually <laughs> read and figure out uh, how to graduate from school. So parents wanting their kids to be doctors, engineers, you know, lawyers, and any of those industries, you know, it's perfectly fine, but it's okay to not be in any of those industries. Like I ended up being fine. I didn't end up being an accountant or whatever. My dad was thought I was very unintelligent for a long time because <laughs> I didn't actually, you know, read or care about school, but I ended up being fine, right? And it's because later on in life, I found my calling. I found that I was what, what I was good at. And the one thing I want to really remind you is 
in order to actually want to read, you have to be first interested in reading in certain type of books. If a certain type of book uh, becomes of interest to you, you actually adopt to that book and then you maybe read a couple more of those books. And then it just becomes very easy for you to you know, read a textbook because now you've been so accustomed to reading one type of book that the other one will be so easy. If you just jump into a book that you really, really hate, like a textbook or a novel that you just can't read because of school or whatever, it becomes very difficult for you because you think this is what reading is. And then you become so opposed to wanting to read because you're like, okay, if this is what reading is, I do not want to do it. Right? So what I recommend is read books on personal development because sometimes those books, they're very, very interesting. And they actually provide you great points in terms of how to be successful in life. And the more you read those, and once you've established that set of uh, reading skills, then you can work on your textbook side, which is at school. All right, mashallah, Prince. Uh, I'm, I'll hold you to it, like in terms of that, of that, uh, of the ending, where we can maybe offer some recommendations of books and things of that nature, personal development. That's a good point. I also like to re-emphasize that when it comes to reading a, a, a book type that you enjoy, you actually want to do it, like you know, actually want to pursue, it. and it will lead you to that. I can't. And, that, that's so true. I can't tell you how many times I've read a book and that book led me to another book and that book led me to another. It's almost like not a goose hunt, but uh, it was a good, like a good hunt, I should say. Like it's, it, it was a great, it was a great. Um, it's like a treasure, right? You're like going in, you know, then eventually get that X marks the spot. Um, Amanda, let me ask you this. Uh, when it comes to, now let's, let's shift gears for a moment. Let's talk about Islam for a second because, you know, we're talking about Muslim youth. One of the biggest things that's happening right now is if you tell me, Amanda, what's the number one text for Muslims, like religious wise, what would you say? The Quran? Yes. Now, yeah. the Quran, the big, yeah, the, the Q, yes. the Quran. This is God's message to humanity sent from the seventh heaven. Amanda, yeah. Amanda, Amanda, let me ask you why aren't enough muslims reading the quran what's going on in your opinion what's happening if, if this book is so important it's supposed to be the instruction manual how come muslim and again i'm including myself princes we're all none of us are none of us are in a scholarly position we all could use uh work in terms of improving our relationship but generally speaking for someone who's didn't open it for days or months or years or just completely abandoned it amanda what's going on why are a lot of muslim youth just completely negligent about the Quran in general? Um, it could be for a couple of reasons. I would say maybe, maybe it could be the language barrier because since the Quran, the original text is written in Arabic and if they're not Arabic speakers and they don't know how to read or write in Arabic or know how to read in Arabic, that might discourage them to actually read the Quran since the language is not familiar to them. Another reason might be that maybe they rely on technology like listening to the Quran uh, by audio, so like by the internet. So while they're working, they actually hear, like they actually listen to the Quran, but by verbal, uh, by uh, audio, uh, not actually physically reading the book by hand. So that could be the alternative to actually reading. So they don't abandon it completely. Uh, the next thing is maybe they felt like they don't have enough time. Like maybe they didn't actually manage their time very well to try to read the Quran. So it just ends up not being able for them to read for a while. I see. All right. Fair enough, Amanda. Good points. Uh, the Quran is in the Arabic language. Yes, that's true. Uh, even still, like with those translations that are all over the, I mean, Again, I'm going to give a shout out to Imam Mustafa Khattab, Dr. Mustafa Khattab with the clear Quran. This is something that he tried to bridge that gap to speaking to what you're saying. Uh, even still, maybe that, maybe the fact that, oh, I can't speak Arabic, so I can't get the real or the actual or the full, you know, message. So why bother? And they just kind of abandon it. Fair enough. And a good point when it, when it comes to listening. Uh, Prince, let me ask you, man, like, because now, you know, speaking as... From, from a perspective of, of someone who's who's seen a lot of Muslim youth who maybe like, you know, you mentioned personal development, you got the secular side of things. Um, although again, not from a, uh, from a scholarly perspective, but I mean, just from a basic foundation understanding, if you ask someone, you know, it's shocking that you tell someone, hey, have you heard the story of, of Joseph, peace be upon him, and they have no idea about him being in the well and 
like they're, they're just completely disengaged and disconnected. What's your humble estimation or observation with regards to youth not even connecting at least to some level with the Quran, even though it's supposed to be the central text for Muslims? Yeah, uh, another good question, Muhammad. What I've realized society now, um, there's a lot of children or youth that are really uh, struggling with ADD because of telephones and, you know, different devices that are just available. Now, that leads me to the next point. Why don't they pay attention to it? Because there's a mental block. Would you rather look at a tablet or would you rather read a book, right? It's just, it, it makes it so much more difficult because once you read a book, now you have to interpret what it means. You have to look into it further. It requires a lot more analysis. And a lot of youth nowadays, they're like, that's for school, right? I don't want to be focusing on that on my off time. I want to be doing things that I want to be doing. So unfortunately, you know, it's it's not the way that we want society to be growing, but because of the introduction of technology and devices, we've transformed our society into something that's more focused around, you know, videos and, you know, content that's audio related, right? We don't want to be reading just because, you know, it just takes too much time and effort. And I think in the next couple of years, if, you know, if this continues and videos become even a bigger thing and, you know, audio becomes a bigger thing, you're going to see a lot less of people reading because there's going to be a huge gap in wanting to understand what that means versus just watching it and just seeing what it says and you're okay with that. I see, right. Good point. So when it comes to video lectures, it's a, it's a lot more appealing to hear, let's say, a very entertaining speaker talk or, or dissect the Quran in a meaningful way rather than, okay, you just you know, you do all the work for me rather than me going and exercising my reading muscles in that regard. Uh, just a quick question for both of you. Again, this is a question for myself, too, is that when it comes to, you know, now we're in this at the time of this recording, at the time of this, you know, at the time of this interview, we're currently going through this whole coronavirus situation, COVID-19. And it was a very unique Ramadan. Um, I'm curious, has has, you know, the fact that we had to stay in lockdown has it has it given us more of an opportunity to read? Like, I mean, if we look up, took a brutal, honest look in the mirror, have we? Has it has it jump started? Um, you know, more, you know, more of a closer connection to that uh, Quran. Amanda, if I can ask you first, like during quarantine this Ramadan, has it somewhat? And if so, what were some of the things that you learned because of that? Like, was did lockdown help you focus more? Like anything of that nature. I'm just curious uh, to hear your thoughts on that. Actually, I did actually think that the COVID-19 lockdown did actually help me because I did actually engage reading the Quran more and I actually did read the clear translation from Mustafa Khattab uh, during Ramadan because I thought, because since we're in lockdown, that sort of, well, for me, it gave me more time to actually read. And since it was also Ramadan as well, on top of that, I thought there's no other good chance than to actually start reading the Quran and also read the translations as well. So it actually did for me. However, for other people, it kind of depends because it also kind of depends on what they do uh, in Ramadan when it wasn't locked down, because I think usually people are usually uh, uh, people usually do, uh, continue their habits. So usually they wouldn't change significantly most of the time, but it, but it would depend on the, on the individual. Maybe they do change, maybe not. But I think it really is about what the person's like situation is, um, if they have a busy schedule or if they're, like what they usually, how do they usually, what do they usually do when they fast for Ramadan as well? Because like, that's also an important part to it as well too. Mashallah, great point. So I guess lockdown really forced you to to take away that excuse of saying, I don't have time, I can't commute this and the other. Good point, Mashallah, that's good. How about you, Prince? Like I'm sure, again, we can all, I'm including myself in this conversation, we can all use areas of improvement for everyone. But can I kindly ask just to see like, um, did, was it a similar result for you? Did you um, have a similar experience? This uh, um, no, good question. Um, mashallah, this Ramadan was probably the first Ramadan I actually completed all five prayers, like continued, wow. uh, because I had more time, you know, to spend, and then I had time with family. But I also had just the prayers were so important. 
that I was like, you know, but because I'm home, I'm going to be focusing on that. Unfortunately, I didn't read the Quran as much, uh, only because, you know, we all, we all have excuses. I'm not going to tell you an excuse, uh, but it's just the mental gap, right? It's like, okay, now you have to take out a Quran. You have to read that. You have to work. You have to go take care of your child. There's all these different things that play into a factor in your life. And when you have ADD, like I have ADD myself, right? I can't look at a piece of paper more than a, maybe a minute or two without, you know, having to look somewhere else or do something else. So unfortunately, it wasn't the same result as Amanda had, which is, you know, mashallah, Amanda, that's amazing. But on the prayer side of things, I was able to, you know, incorporate a lot of, more of that into my life. Mashallah, Prince, man, I appreciate the honesty, man. Like at the end of the day, Again, we all have our unique circumstances, not one person judge another. But at the end of the day, I mean, just the fact that you're striving and trying. And again, the whole what, what the whole the whole purpose of prayer and what's the whole the prayer encompassing, right? It's a lot of it has to do with it. So that's, again, kudos to all. And may Allah to help us all like to, to be the best versions of ourselves in the best way uh, that's most pleasing. So I just wanted to, yeah, I'm really just wanted to see if lockdown had anything uh, to do with that. Now, I'm curious for you both. I, I'm really, really fascinated to know. Um, Amanda, let me start with you. Was there a book, again, religious or not, that maybe had a, had a certain chapter or a certain paragraph or a sentence or just something that really changed your life, really gave you a new, fresh perspective on things? Was there anything that you can recall, you think back and you're saying, wow, this book, when I think about it, really impacted me in so many different ways. Um, it could be a whole book. It could be a section of a book. It could be like, could you think of one book that really transformed the way you look at something and in terms of life? Yes, actually I do. Uh, the book that I'd say really changed my insights was by a book from Richard Carlson, uh, Stop Thinking, Start Living. And the main point that I really got from Richard Carlson was when he said that it's not actually the, like the feelings you get is not actually from the experience, but rather it is your thoughts about the experience that's making you feel a particular way. And I felt that was very insightful for me because I never really thought of, thought of it like, put a step back and think, actually, it's my thoughts that actually curate my perceptions or curate my, like, my views about how I view events or how I view other people. I just used to take it like as face value and say, well, it's, you know, the event is here or that person is there, but I never really step back and said, well, actually, it's my thoughts that are creating that. So I would, yeah, I would definitely say Richard Carlson, Stop thinking, start living. Wow, mashallah, look at that. And for those viewers, well, Richard Carlson, uh, he's also, I think he's best known for, Amanda, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he's best known for Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Yeah, that's true. That, that's his most famous work. So Richard Carlson, that's a very good point. It's not a, So the experience is neutral, but it's your thoughts about the experience that color uh, or shape your emotions about it. You could have a bad day. Um, because your thoughts about this particular thing is what's causing the, the anger and turmoil. That's a really powerful, there you go, Marshall. That's a great concept and tool that we could all use. And then that speaks to what Prince was saying about self-development. Uh, and then in those kind of books, self-help books, I think really offer a lot of uh, unique perspectives. So Prince, I, uh, let's turn it to you. Was there a book, secular or religious, that you look to and you're saying, yeah, this really changed uh, or really influenced my way of thinking about life or helped me got to a certain point. Can you think of one uh, that, that really impacted you? I can actually. Um, it's called This I Know. It's Marketing Lessons from Under the Influence by Terry O'Reilly. And one chapter in the book talks about putting the shish on your shish kebab. And as funny as that sounds... Talk to us about what? I mean, let's, let's see. What, what does it mean, right? Say that again. What was it? Cleaning the shish on the shish kebab? No, putting the shish on your shish kebab. Putting the shish on the shish kebab. All right, let's talk. Okay, let's talk. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. So you, you know the skewer, right? Oh, so yeah. So basically talks about how your personal growth and development and your marketing as a business really comes down from being able to put pieces together on a skewer, and that's how you really develop your personal brand. So by reading this chapter, I realized that there's lots of different pieces in my life where if I don't, if I keep, don't keep putting pieces of chicken on my, my skewer, 
it's not never going to grow, right? My personal brand is never going to grow. It's not going to be as juicy or succulent as you want it to be. So <laughs> I'm just uh, sorry for that. I'm just thinking about a growing kebab or skewer. Like it's just, can you imagine a restaurant that's like that? You have a kebab, like a skewer, and you just keep having on that. Forgive yeah. me for interrupting, but yeah, continue. Sure. I'm just thinking about that. Like this. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why I thought this would be funny, a uh, funny example. But at the same time, you think about how your branding as a human being is so relevant to a shish kebab or a skewer, right? Yeah. <laughs> the more pieces you put on there, the better and bigger that you get. But if you decide to stop your learning, you stop your growth, not decide to do certain things in your life because you don't feel like doing them, then that shish kebab or that skewer is never going to grow, right? So that was a big uh, piece for me where I was like, you know what, I need to really develop myself. So by reading that chapter, I, then I started doing different, uh, you know, key conferences. I started doing a lot of big presentations. Because I knew from there, I was like, you know what, I'm putting that shisha mashish kebab. I'm making sure that I'm growing my personal brand. I'm growing my personal self. Because in this society, in this world, there's nothing bigger and better than your own personal brand and who you are authentically. Because that's what people buy. Well, you think people buy products? Very similar to when they hire you for a job. They're buying a product because you are the product for that specific job. So by growing your, your, your network, you're going to obviously, you know, be more successful and Things like that. Mashallah, man. Your personal brand, shish kebab, I guess it's time. Uh, I mean, hey, now is as good a time as any. If you want to pivot over to the restaurant business, this is uh, – that's it, man. Prince shish kebab. Or, well, I don't know. You know well, well, it's a work in progress. But that's awesome, man. Like, that's so true when it comes to personal brand. I mean, people don't buy, you know, what you do. They buy why you do it, and they buy who you are, right? Like, you know, how many times have you tried to get referrals – uh, and just because of the person you reached out to, they're like, Hey, I know, like, for example, if you say, Hey, I need a painter and you reach out to a buddy and that buddy recommends someone, are you much more likely to go after that person? Yeah. Because of your buddy that you built that connection with. So yeah, nothing stronger or nothing is more valuable than your personal brand. That's awesome, man. Masha, great shish kebab, uh, analogy. If I can kindly share for both of you, like, you know, since you, you pulled something, I, I'd like to pull something as well. Um, there was something called the jelly effect. Unfortunately, the author escapes me, but the jelly effect, there's two cool things I learned from that book. Number one, the author was blind. This is one thing that I thought was just, oh man, when someone says I, I have, you know, that just, you know, knocked my socks off because how cool is that? You know, that someone is visually impaired and yet they decide to say, I'm going to write a book. So that's number one. That was one really cool thing. The second thing one of the biggest takeaways I got from reading that book was that it's speaking about sales, you know, people are so quick to buy things, but you know what, what, what really separates the top sales from, you know, the top products from the ones that aren't so great is that they buy who they become after. That's what you should be really selling. So example, people don't buy toothpaste. They're buying white teeth right? Your teeth to be whiter. That's what they're buying. People don't buy your glasses. They're buying 2020 vision. So the best salespeople that he was saying, or the best kind of companies when they're really packaging, um, that they're not buying the product. It's who you become after you get the product. That's where you really, um, get the, get the real juice out of it. So yeah, I thought I'd share that with both of you, man, because it was a jelly effect. Really cool stuff. Masha, we talked about self-development, about thoughts, one thing to throw in the mix to talk about uh, about sales and then again like it's who you become after that's that's the real target here i uh, wanted to share that with you so now having said that I'm, I'm let's let's take the conversation to another route um amanda if i can hear from you when it comes to to reading in general do you have any strategies i'm sure a lot of people who are watching this they're saying yeah this is great i'm really pumped do you have any strategies for someone who, let's say, it's 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 a real hard time for them to pick up a book? What would you say? What would be some strategies that you could offer to help people exercise their reading muscles? I have a couple of suggestions. Uh, my first suggestion would be you can start small. Like you can start with something, a quick read. Like, for example, a quick read from a magazine, like a magazine that has pictures, 
and short text. You can start small like that. Like uh, if you have any magazines lying down in the house, you can try to try to see those kinds of magazines. Uh, and also, I would also suggest to look for, like try to look for a theme that really interests you, a theme that you really are really interested about. Like for example, if uh, interested in self-development, uh, self-help books, for example, that that particularly is my like like strong interest in area of reading. Then I would suggest to look at something in that kind, like a subtopic in that area, and try to find like try to try try out some authors, try out some a variety of different authors, and try to see which which of their writing uh, like of the writing that you really enjoy, like which one you think it's easy and effective and and uh, kind of goes to the point and keep going from there because reading has a really strong impact on a person. It really helps them understand, like it broadens their perspective, it broadens their view, it broadens their vocabulary. You you will learn like new vocabulary words you haven't learned before that you can always use at other times. You will also gain writing, uh, like writing, because you can see like a sense and structure and punctuation and grammar. And you can also kind of go through a journey with the author to learn more about discovery and empowerment and impact. Look at that, Amanda. You already got a lot of things lined up. Amazing, amazing. Lots of tools. Start small. Don't just jump into a 400-page textbook and think I'm going to just plow through it to the next day. That ain't going to happen, right? So, all right, amazing. Good stuff, Amanda. Just keep it simple. Keep it short. And, again, speaking to Prince's point, you know, like where, let's say, you, you can't read for more than a minute or two. Prince, can you help us out here? What are some tips or strategies that you found to be useful when it comes to exercising those reading muscles? I actually have several tips I can give you because I just trial and error for me and I've been trying to do everything to help myself and eventually got the hang of it. The first one is pretty funny, but uh, you should have both of your nostrils open. And <laughs> this is funny because from my experience, I can tell you that if you have a clogged nose, it's much harder to actually read and interpret information. Because the right side takes in the information, the left side interprets what that information is saying. So if you don't have both of your nostrils open, what you're going to have is a mental block where you're, you're not going to be able to iterate or understand what the content is saying. And you're going to have migraines or headaches. And you're, you may have difficulty actually understanding what you're reading. So you may be reading, but you're not comprehending what you're reading. And as funny as it sounds, if you think about it, it it's so true because your brain is lacking oxygen if both of your nostrils are not open. So number one. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You got to maybe for like to... I don't want to say demonstrate, but like by nostrils open, you mean like making sure they're not clogged? Like what, yeah. what do you mean by keeping them open? Just if you you got to make sure that uh, you're getting oxygen from both your left and your right nose coming into your brain because that oxygen is helping your brain, you know, function, right? And if one side is not functioning, you're going to have more difficulty. And I suffered with a lot of migraines. And then when I was studying, my left nose is always clogged. So whenever I'm reading stuff, I'm always getting headaches and migraines. And you may experience that. It's mainly because you're, taking in information, but you're not able to sort that information in your mind because your brain is lacking that oxygen. As funny as it sounds, it's worked for me. That's right? cool. <laughs> right. Number two, every time I'm reading, after I read two, three pages, I actually close my eyes and take a breath for about 20 seconds. And this allows my brain to kind of catch up with all the information I've just learned. And I, in my mind, I'm just going through some of the things I've just kind of put in my mind and what I've just learned. And then I start reading again to the next piece. And that way, you know, you're comprehending what Resting breaks are very important. Every 20 to 30 minutes, you know, take at least a 10 minute break. This will allow your brain to get the necessary rest in order for you to start up again and then read again. If you don't do that, your brain's going to keep going and going and going. And then you're going to have so much information overload that you're not going to want to continue or you're going to have difficulty. Uh, turn off all of your distractions, right? Like I have ADD. So for example, you know, if I'm on my computer, I'm reading an ebook. Next thing, you, like you mentioned earlier, now I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm looking at someone's post and I don't know where I ended up, but you got to close all your distractions, especially because, you know, you want to be focusing on all what you're learning. And the two main points, aside from, you know, this holistic stuff is number one, you can start a mind map with some of the books that you're reading. 
So take each chapter and break it up, centralize that point of what the main point of this chapter is and create a web around, you know, what is that chapter talking about? What is the next chapter talking about? What is the next chapter talking about? And the mind map will help you really develop, you know, what the entire book has discussed. So instead of you having to go back through the book and reread re re the book, now you're easily able to identify points. Another thing that's worked for me is PowerPoint. So when I'm reading a textbook, like say an ebook, I take certain points from that ebook and I put it in the PowerPoint and I make it like a presentation. So when, I, when I'm going through it, in my mind, it's like I'm reading a presentation versus reading a book. And it makes reading a lot more easier because I'm taking the key points versus every single thing that's written in the book. So those are things that I've tried and if it's worked for me, so hopefully, you know, it can work for someone else as well. Marshall, that's amazing, man. That, again, that nostril uh, advice, like that's something that you don't hear every day. But hey, you, I think you, you, it speaks a lot to what, uh, what we're saying, like having those, uh, keeping the, the oxygen in the brain and making sure that, you know, because it's, it's, I don't know about you too, but I'm sure you've experienced when you go through a heavy book, like you feel like, the world is caving in on you. It's, it's a lot of energy. Right? It's not, it's not like you're just sitting passively and enjoying a movie. It's active, right? Rather than passive. You're not just absorbing the information that way. You're actually trying to interpret it and, and read through it. So great, great stuff. Now we have time for just one more question for you both. Um, really appreciate this conversation. And before I kind of make concluding remarks, Amanda, if I can ask, uh, are there any books that you would recommend for, for our Muslim youth to read? What are some examples of books that's helped you out? What are some some things on your reading list that you would love to share with others? Yeah, I have some suggestions. Uh, I would suggest to read uh, Richard Carlson's book. So Stop, Stop Thinking, Start Living. Um, also another book that I thought was really good, written by the same author, uh, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And the last book I would suggest is uh, What About the Big Stuff? Yeah, those three I thought are really, uh, really good and they're really insightful. And it would help give a different perspective, like how it gave a different perspective for me about, like, about thinking and about behavior. And I thought, uh, hopefully it would help others too, like how it helped me. Amazing, amazing. Watch all the good stuff. And uh, take it to you, Prince. What are some books that you would recommend? If, let's say, you, someone is stranded on an island and they are only with these books, what books would they be? Well, if you're stranded on an island, these books probably won't be uh, as effective. But uh, I've enjoyed Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, Robert T. Kiyosaki. Um, the main reason I enjoy that book is you understand the difference between someone who can make financial freedom from themselves and someone who is having struggles and they're just living day to day, but they can't go above and beyond. Um, the This I Know book from Terry O'Reilly, fantastic book on personal branding and being able to really develop your, your business brand as well as your own personal brand. And then Tony Robbins is also a great author as well. Unshakable is a great book. Um, you know, these are life skill books that I say are very important. Uh, although, you know, they might not be culturally sort of in, in, in the Islamic world, you know, financial freedom sounds like, okay, you know, interest, suit, things like that. You don't focus on that. You learn from, you know, what are these people doing to be successful, right? It's the core message you're going to be getting out of uh, these books. And these are some of the ones I can recommend that, you know, you can start reading and you're going to probably have a good time and really enjoy the content with them. Mashallah, amazing, amazing stuff. I'll also throw in a couple in the mix too, just to kind of make it complete. I mentioned the jelly effect. That's a good book as well. And you, as you probably know, really into public speaking, really into communication. One really, really good book is called Talk Like Ted. That's an awesome book. It's gonna, it's a great way for you and I to structure our communication, our day to day. You don't have to get up on stage. You don't have to get a microphone. You don't have to be a professional public speaker to benefit from it. So Jelly Effect, Talk Like Ted, uh, Amanda had Richard Carlson. And Prince, you had like Tony Robbins and This I Know and Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Lots of books, lots of great stuff. And again, thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Your Highness, Prince. I'm telling you, man. Uh, Prince, amazing. Both of you have been spectacular. And I hope and pray that 
you continue your your reading journey it's not over it's just the beginning as always the more books you pick up there is a million different options no exaggeration there's a million different books in your libraries and if not in the library then you have the whole world wide web to choose from so thank you both so much and i hope and pray that for those watching this are able to reignite that spark of reading um, thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Prince. And I have one thing to say to you right now, directly to the viewers here. If you're a Muslim youth and you're watching this, and let's just say you look at books and you're saying, you know, it's not really cool. Let me share with you one humble thing from one brother to from a brother to a brother or a brother to a sister that not many people read these days. They don't. You're going to be a diamond in the rough, and people judge based on the library that you have up here. Depending on the books that you have up here that you've read and internalized, not just skim through it, actually internalized, it's going to make a world of a difference. It's going to broaden your perspective. You will be a better person. You will be a bigger person. You will be achieving things you've never achieved simply because you went the extra mile and started including things in your reading lists. How do I know? Go ask the greatest CEOs of all time. It's no coincidence that they all have book clubs, that they all have reading lists. The greatest CEOs of all time, go look at any of them. They always read always make time for it. And so I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this conversation has been beneficial in any way, shape, or form. Again, if you've been watching this, we always want to have a two-way conversation. You're more than welcome to connect with Muslim Network TV. Questions, comments, concerns, by all means. We want to engage and have a conversation with you both. It's been fun. It's been a pleasure. Tune in every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with the Canada Today Youth Edition. I'm your host, Mohammed Maxwell Hassan. And stay strong, stay safe, and stay positive. And stay proud of being Muslims. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.